two, one. The lift off it was called. Welcome to the Ketamine Startup Podcast. This is where we talk about the business of ketamine infusion clinics, marketing, and more. And in this episode, we go over a question that we often get asked. Will the legalization of MDMA and psilocybin therapy be a threat to ketamine infusion clinics? To cover this, we go over the mechanisms of actions for these medications, set and setting, and more. Sam and I had a fun time during this conversation, and we hope you do too. So let's dive into the episode. Welcome back to the Ketamine Startup Podcast. We're so excited you're here and listening or watching the video and podcast today. Today, we're going to be talking about MDMA and psilocybin. What's interesting is all three of these can be considered psychedelics. So we want to talk about the role of ketamine therapy as MDMA and psilocybin becomes legalized, decriminalized, healthcare revolutionized to see what's going to occur. So Kim, question for you. Does the legalization of MDMA and psilocybin pose a threat to ketamine clinics? My thought right off the bat is no. It like for me when I hear about things that are in the same quote unquote class and there's going to be folks out there who's listening or watching this and they're going to say ketamine's not a psychedelic, MDMA and psilocybin are psychedelics, so why are you comparing apples to oranges? But for others, they're like it's all these non-ordinary states. These are innovative treatments that create non-ordinary states, so put them all together. And honestly, to the average physician, average healthcare that are like the dinosaurs, no offense, but you know what I'm saying? They put it all together. They see ketamine as something you use for sedation, but when people don't use it for sedation or procedures, they're using it as recreationally. And so they just group it all together. So of course, that question of what are we going to do? Do I need to start like do I need to start going to part like to these, we call them trainings so we can do MDMA in our clinics and blah, blah, blah. I don't think it, I honestly, it, let's see how this ages and what I, when 10 years from now, how my prediction is, but I say, no, it's not a threat. How about you, Sam? It's interesting because as some of the listeners and viewers may know that MDMA therapy takes a really long time. So for example, one MDMA session may last 12 hours or 14 hours or 10 hours. That's a long time for two healthcare providers, clinicians, therapists, et cetera, to be with a patient one-on-one -on -one, or actually two-on-one -on -one for that prolonged period of time. So I feel like that's one of the challenges with MDMA therapy. And I think currently MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, and I think they rebanded to a new name, but I know that the time and the energy required for each patient takes a tremendous amount of resources. And it makes me a little bit concerned because there's already a shortage of licensed therapists, mental health professionals, et cetera. And then to have them bottlenecked in a way or tied up really doing important work for 10 to 12 hours, that can be challenging. Similar thing with psilocybin, that takes six to eight hours. I think there is one place in Oregon because it has become legalized as of this recording where they're doing six to eight to 10 hour sessions. And again, this is a big concern with these other psychedelics. Now, ketamine may not be considered a classical psychedelic, but it is a dissociative anesthetic and it does create psychotropic effects as our patients have reported and their experiences, whether it's mystical experiences and pathogenic spiritual experiences. Um, but one of the things that I really appreciate about ketamine is the duration of length when we use it intravenously, and that's how we do it at our clinic, and that's what we teach our students, the onset is pretty fast in a gradual way. And then once the IV infusion, roughly 40, 45 minutes is completed, then the patient's consciousness returns fairly close to baseline, although we don't want them to drive. So I think this is where the ketamine therapy can play a role because it is shorter sessions, roughly 90 minutes to two hours. It's like you're touching on the topic or or the aspect of scalability and access, just because there's gonna be less resources. Time-wise, professionally, this gives ketamine, I wouldn't say an edge, but it differentiates it from those two therapies, because those are gonna be highly regulated. Their protocol is highly regulated. And if I understand correctly, it's not necessarily just the medication itself that's gonna be, what do you call it, not copyrighted, 
not incorporated, but it's like the, even the process itself, right? It's, there's a, obviously it sounds like I'm not too well versed in this, but I know it's not just going to be like, oh, we FDA approved it. Now anybody can use it any way you want. Right. So they probably, they're probably going to have a REMS protocol, risk evaluation, minimization strategy, REMS, which is applied to like Spravato, aka intranasal esketamine by Janssen, where they have really strict protocols, really strict guidelines that the clinician needs to follow. And I imagine that'll be similar with the MDMA therapy where there will be some sort of risk evaluation and minimization strategy prior to those patients actually getting it. And I think one of the key components of that is they do psychotherapy. And I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's like 12 sessions of psychotherapy as well as two MDMA medicine sessions. And then the psilocybin, it's still, I think, FDA. It's early, phase one, phase two, possibly phase three. But I do know that the MDMA is coming out soon. Whereas right now, ketamine is currently available for use by responsible clinicians. Taking a bit of a detour is like, when we get this question, we get this question a lot, especially when we host our webinars or get emails from folks or DM'd in our on our socials, it's what about the future is the like kind of the underlying question. Uh, it's okay, ketamine is a little bit out there, but eventually it's not going to be as out there as compared to psilocybin and MDMA. And it's, I just really find it as a fascinating question because there's always going to be a space, in my opinion, for ketamine therapy, because not everybody is going to be able to meet the criteria for getting these substances, getting these treatments. There's going to be folks that may not meet the criteria, whether it is medically, it may be like a socially or a support infrastructure type of thing. There's going to be folks that can't commit to those six, eight, 10 hours. Maybe they don't have the financial or social support to be able to do that. They just can't take that time out for their job or from their job to do this. And yet ketamine therapy would be an alternative because for a 40 minute session can be anywhere between 90 minutes to two hours, door in, door out. So it's having options when there's different medical diagnoses, there's not just one treatment. Sure, there are some disorders and diseases that do have just one treatment, but there's many that have different ones. There's options. I love that example because it makes me think about if someone has an infection, let's say, I'm not going to just use one antibiotic for every single individual. I'm going to tailor it to that individual and that infection. When I was working in the ER, my favorite is, of course, vancozos, right? So for those listeners who are familiar, vancomycin and zosin, I would give that pretty frequently as a broad spectrum. But again, it might be some weird atypical bacteria that's causing it. And this is a really good example. Yeah, we need multiple therapeutic options. And I am a big fan of MDMA psilocybin therapy and the research behind there because it's quite robust. Bust. I think those are going to be really transformational and groundbreaking. And I do agree with you that there's still going to be an opportunity for ketamine infusions. And I think it's going to be here for a long time because again, it is just another tool in our arsenal of tools that we can use for both mental and physical health. And now a quick word for our aspiring ketamine clinic founders out there. If you've tuned into our episode today, chances are you're curious about the ins and outs of starting up a ketamine clinic. It's an exciting field, but let's face it, the journey from idea to actually opening day can be quite daunting. That's why we've created something special for you. Think of it as your personal roadmap, a free downloadable checklist that lays out the essential steps you need to consider when starting up your own ketamine clinic. This checklist is designed to help you avoid common pitfalls and launch your trajectory to success. So how can you get your hands on this checklist? Simple. Just visit www.ketaminestartup.com forward slash checklist and grab your free copy today. We've made it easy and accessible because we believe in supporting our community with valuable resources. KetamineStartup.com forward slash checklist. All right, let's get back to our discussion. Stay tuned and don't forget to download your free checklist during or after. And I think those that are already have a clinic or are thinking of having a clinic and you're like, they're not really sure about, should I just go down the route of getting trained so I can become like a center that provides this future psilocybin MDMA therapy, or, hey, I'm already a licensed physician. I'm already an anesthesiologist. I'm already a ER doc, a psychiatrist. Ah, there's all like, hey, if, if it's, I'm all about calling. Is it calling you 
to start this clinic? Is this, is it your calling? Are you fascinated by the research behind ketamine therapy? Are you fascinated with this, what is emerging that society is understanding that psychedelic experiences when it has the proper container to have it occur can be very healing. If that's calling you and you're like, I could do ketamine now versus waiting later to see how these things all pan out legally for psilocybin MDMA, then if you do start, so then I, you know, in other words, I'm saying you jump into starting your business, starting your practice with ketamine therapy. Okay. Then later on when MDMA and psilocybin get legalized, because I really think it's like, it's not a matter of if, but when, or even where perhaps maybe some States and other ones not, uh, well, then you're already going to be practicing in this space in this psychedelic, not an ordinary state, mental health, pain treatment space. You already know how to run your practice. And when I say run your practice, I'm not just saying the medical mental health side. I'm talking about the hiring, firing, buying a chair when it's broken and you need to replace it. It's running your business. You'll be able to add or pivot much more easily than somebody that has no experience. It's so true. And I do want to rewind a little bit and talk about MDMA and uh, psilocybin and ketamine. So for those listeners who are not aware, MDMA is based from an amphetamine, methamphetamine derived medication. And then psilocybin is naturally occurring. It's coming from fungi. And although they are creating derivatives of that, and then ketamine is based upon fencyclidine back in the 1960s and then reinvented and turned into ketamine back in uh, 1962, I believe. So the reason I bring this up is they all have different mechanisms of action. So the MDMA is going to work on the dopamine receptors. The psilocybin is going to work on the serotonin receptors. The ketamine is going to work on the glutamate and MDA receptors. So again, these are targeting different mechanisms and different neurotransmitters. And again, I think all of them can be useful. And the key component to underline is the set and the setting regarding these medications, because we've heard of people using MDMA, like we have a really popular music festival here. It's called Coachella in Indio, California. And I know there's a lot of MDMA use probably when they're listening to their favorite band or DJ or whatever. So uh, the set and the setting and recognizing how important that is with these therapeutic medications, I think is also very essential. Yeah, that's, that's the, that's hitting it on the head. It's that it's that container, the infrastructure that's set up, not just even in the clinic or in the space that is that the individual, the patient's going to be receiving it, but the infrastructure around before they go in to your clinic and then even after is going to be huge. And so if you're having fast forwarding back to you're a ketamine specialist, you have run your business, you've run your practice, you'll understand this concept of preparation before the treatment and integration and action taking after the treatment. And there's very few, I'm trying to think of any in like the classic allopathic Western medicine of where you think of the, the preparation and the integration of a treatment, because most of the time it's a you go in, you take care of it, you get out versus a experience that one has, or maybe even there should be more. I mean, we have the preparation of don't eat, no eating after midnight and make sure you have a ride and no using heavy machinery afterwards. Like we have those to the, almost like the CYA type of preparation and integration afterwards, but the actual preparation for the experience itself. But I'm like, this is, this treatment is an experiential treatment as well as on a biological level. So it's having that infrastructure, having that, knowing how to teach this or to communicate it to your patients in the ketamine space can translate well, I predict, in the future, if one is to pivot or to add these other treatments in the future. I actually had an idea where you're talking about preparation and integration. And in the, an example of this in the medical model would be if someone's getting, let's say, a knee replacement right? That's a pretty major thing. My mom got her knees replaced, one knee replaced. But if someone wants to get a knee replacement, for example, 
then they want to prepare for it, i.e. get their body as physically healthy as possible, make sure their blood pressure is controlled, cholesterol, etc. make sure they're exercising, make, maybe make sure all these other limbs are prepared because it's going to be atrophying as they're sitting and recovering. And then they get the actual surgery or the knee replacement. And then the integration would be physical therapy where they're going to their PT specialist and doing recumbent bike exercises or quad strengthening exercises, whatever it may be. So there can be, I think, a little bit of a a model. That's good. That's honestly a really great way of explaining it because I'm realizing, oh, we actually already have it in this. Because you're talking more of like lifestyle type of things. And for most mainstream healthcare, it's not this holistic approach. And so having that holistic approach and now having an example from which most folks can understand. And when I'm, when I'm talking about folks, people working hard, slogging away in the hospital. It's, yeah, you can translate that to psychedelic experiences and treatments. Beautiful. So let's summarize what we've discussed. We talked about MDMA, psilocybin coming down the pipeline and how that could potentially impact ketamine clinics. We talked about how one of the challenges in scalability or doing these other treatments is the length of time. So MDMA can take 10 to 12 hours really energy intensive, human capital intensive, as well as with psilocybin. And then we also talked about how if someone opens up a clinic now and they specialize in ketamine, then they will be familiar with these non-ordinary states of consciousness, as well as the preparation, intentions, experience, and integration. So bottom line is that I think the ketamine infusions will always be here. It's another tool in the arsenal. And it works in a different mechanism of action. So I would say, don't be afraid of these other medications. They're at the end of the day, as healthcare professionals, we're here to just help people, regardless of what it is. That's my goal. Like I look at the science, I practice evidence-based medicine, and really, what's going to help that individual for their certain condition? And it may be one antibiotic for that infection, or a different antibiotic for some rare bacteria. So really targeting the medication for the patient in an appropriate way. I think you bring it up a really good point. Like when this question of, oh, is this going to, is this going to be competition for my clinic? I realize that really comes from a place of fear and not abundance and worrying about my business. But when we take it on from the angle of what's going to be best for our patient, there's going to be some folks where they like so, so response to ketamine, but then in the future, you'd be able to say, Hey, you know what? Maybe we should consider psilocybin. Maybe MDMA would be a better fit for you. So it's honestly, it's it's something, it's really beautiful to be able to offer. We'd love to cure everyone of depression and PTSD. And then that's not going to happen, but be able to, when our patients don't do well on ketamine, we'd be able to say, hey, what's awesome is we have some other options. There's the that ability to be able to try different things. And then, hey, vice versa, there's going to be folks that they're like, "Ah, I'm not going to do ketamine, but I'm all about the plant. So I want psilocybin. And then they may not respond as well. And then, but because they're, this isn't the uh, the awareness, the cultural zeitgeist, the medical zeitgeist, they're like, hey, you know what? Actually, maybe let me try ketamine. So it's just more options for serving and helping those that need these types of treatments. So for me, even from a marketing standpoint, this is exciting. This is bringing more awareness to what is current and what's in the future. And even when something is uh, not great out in the media about ketamine, even though that doesn't make the ketamine space look great, it brings more awareness. It makes people start thinking, mar- talking about this, trying to educate and f- see what's really going on. And it's, so I think this is an exciting time with, especially with Utah there, they just passed out a law about, they're going to start, I think in May about to, I think it's a pilot study or a pilot program for MDMA and psilocybin. So that's what spurred our conversation on this is there's actual legal, like legislation, things are changing. And yeah, so that's why we just wanted to talk about this today. And thank you for joining us and listening till the very end. It says a lot about you and your commitment to learning more and growing. And we will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.